So I was honored at this event in 2012, and it was so nice to be invited back. In that time frame, uh, two years ago, we had just gotten to the International Space Station with our Dragon capsule. Uh, and uh, I spent the majority of the time because I was asked to talk about my personal story. What I wanted to do today is hijack it a little bit uh, and talk more about SpaceX and what we're doing because I think it's really important uh, for, uh, well, frankly, for humanity. And hopefully I'll do a hand raise at the end to see if you agree with me. So um, I'm here to talk about SpaceX, a little bit about myself, maybe some Q&A as well. In case you don't know what a SpaceX is. All stations verify ready for launch. FTS. FTS go. Prop. Roscoe. ABI. ABI is go. GMC. GMC is go. LD. LD is go. LCO go to initiate terminal count. Three, two, one, zero. Now we're down for the Falcon 9. Falcon 9 has cleared the towers. I can tell you it's a lot easier to watch a launch video after the launch has been done than sitting there in the control center like, <laughs> hoping it goes well. So um, that gives you a little flavor for what we're doing. We build rockets and spaceships. Uh, we were founded by Elon, my boss, in 2002 with the singular purpose to change dramatically uh, the reliability and the cost of access to space to facilitate true exploration of the solar system. And we never talked about this at the beginning, but it was to really to put people on another planet. And Mars happens to be like the next best one, uh, at least in this solar system. We could talk a little bit about Mars later. Um, so SpaceX is a Silicon Valley style company. What does that mean? Um, it means a very flat hierarchy. Best idea wins. We have interns that have designed elements of our rockets and spaceship. So. Um, Elon has a lot of influence, so his ideas are, uh, are often <laughs> accommodated, but they're also always really good ideas, too. Um, but like I say, interns, we have a really strong intern program, and they've had a, they definitely have their, uh, their fingerprints on this rocket. Um, probably the other thing that characterized SpaceX uh, more, than, uh, more than anything else is kind of this concept of no fear, kind of innovate till you're exhausted and uh, don't be afraid to try anything. So it's really an extraordinary company and if you're down in the LA area, I do recommend hooking up with uh, one of the leaders here at Witty and, and we'll try to do a tour for you. It's really an extraordinary place. Metal sheets and blocks come in and uh, out rolls a rocket about a year later. So what are our keys to success? Um, from the get-go, we focused on reliability, obviously in the rocket business, pretty key. Um, I also talked about reducing cost, because right now costs are outrageous in this particular industry. Um, 
But really what we wanted to do was tailor our products to, the, to a very broad market base. We don't just serve the US government. We don't just serve NASA taking the Dragon capsule to the International Space Station. Uh, we have commercial uh, customers. As a matter of fact, about 60% of our customer base is commercial. Uh, and we also have international governments buying our rockets. I have the German uh, uh, Defense Organization buying my rockets. I have the Argentinian Space Agency buying my rockets. I have the Taiwanese Space Agency buying my rockets. So uh, very broad customer base to meet a lot of different needs. Um, in addition, what you, if you know about rocket companies, uh, we are very unique from the perspective that we build, we call it vertically integrated. We build almost everything ourselves. We write our own software, we build our launch sites, we build our tanks, we build our engines, and we build a lot of our avionics as well. So uh, it's pretty unusual. Most aerospace companies are integrators of, uh, of lots of capabilities from, uh, from vendors, but we, we, we're, we're going it alone um, to a large extent. Now we do have tons of vendors. We've got about 3,000 vendors, 1,100 are significantly active. Uh, we spend about 64 cents of every dollar uh, on our suppliers, but they're at a pretty low level of integration by tons of raw material, lots of wire, lots of connectors, lots of fuel. Um, so that's been another reason, I think, uh, for our success, at least in the speed and the pace of our innovation. Um, typically in the aerospace industry, there's lots of failures in the aerospace industry, hopefully not when it comes to the mission, but uh, you know, you're trying to push the boundaries and, and you have component level failures and uh, you wanna get right to it, you wanna talk to that engineer and if that engineer is at a supplier, when that supplier has a failure, you get the lawyer on the phone. Uh, you generally don't get to talk, at least initially, to the engineer. So I think this vertical integration concept uh, was, is an enormously important part of, uh, of SpaceX success. Um, so I did, so I talked background SpaceX. Does everybody have a pretty good feel for the company? Okay, now I wanna talk a little bit about the history because I think it's important to kinda know where you came from to figure out kind of why you're here and also where you're going in the future. And I'm not gonna go through every year. I've only got 23 minutes and 49 seconds left. Um, but uh, but I, I am highlighting some things. Uh, 2002, our year of uh, formulation, uh, we had this giant building, 50,000 square feet in El Segundo, California. Now we've got over a million and we're busting at the seams. Um, we ended 2002 with 14 employees. I'm gonna go through that cycle just to give you guys a concept of the growth. So we work on the Falcon 1 rocket. It was a, a little rocket uh, just to test our technology, our team, and see whether we as a company could get anything to orbit. So this was a huge struggle. It was a huge growth phase for SpaceX. Um, in 2006, we lifted Falcon 1 off for the first time. It failed. Uh, we had a fire in the engine compartment, basically burned through some of the pneumatic lines, uh, stopped flowing gas, and engine stopped and we came back kind of in a very Monty Python-esque way. We went about a mile up and came back fast. Um, we put that photo out on the web right away. It was shocking that that's that middle photo there. You see the conflagration on the engine, which isn't supposed to be there. Um, but we wanted to be really candid with uh, the folks that were following us. Um, so that was the hard part of 2006, but I can honestly say that that day when we launched that rocket, SpaceX grew up. Uh, we were ISO certified in the factory. We were not at the launch site, and it turns out that one of the operations we did at the launch site caused this failure. Uh, so, uh, so we grew up. Uh, it was a tough lesson to learn, but, uh, but important nonetheless. At the end of that year, somehow, we convinced NASA, and we love NASA. We would not be the company we are today without NASA. Somehow we convinced NASA that even though we didn't get our first Falcon 1 to orbit, we were gonna build a rocket 10 times that size and a spaceship named Dragon and take it to the International Space Station. So they gave us a $278 million agreement to try to go do that. I have to say that's gotta be one of the most extraordinary programs that the government has, uh, has developed and worked. So it was called COTS, Commercial Orbital Transportation Services. Two suppliers ultimately uh, were selected and both us and Orbital the, the two suppliers have both developed a new rocket uh, and developed a capability to take cargo to the International Space Station. Now ours is better <laughs> because we can actually bring cargo back because we were looking at carrying crew from the beginning. Um, most of the other capabilities going to the International Space Station bring stuff up and they burn up 
uh, upon reentry uh, back in the atmosphere. But it was an extraordinary day. We were really happy, scared to death, and we ended the year with 224 employees. So then skip ahead two years, 2008, we finally got Falcon 1 to orbit. Um, took us the fourth try to get there. Fourth try was about seven weeks after the third try. But I was really encouraged once we got that video back on the third failure that we had on Falcon 1. Uh, it was pretty clear what happened. We knew how to fix it. We had another rocket in Kwajalein, and we launched it seven weeks later successfully to orbit. So that was extraordinary. Also extraordinary, we had made enough progress on the Falcon 9 launch vehicle and the Dragon capsule uh, that NASA felt comfortable moving from this development contract, that COTS contract that I talked about, to the operational contract called CRS, Cargo Resupply. So we won a $1.6 billion contract uh, in late 2008 uh, to do tw 12 operational missions to the International Space Station. So that was another really great and important year for us. Skip ahead two years, um, another great year. We launched Falcon 9, the bigger rocket for the first time, 100% successful. It was just kind of a demo payload, um, but, uh, but it was enormously helpful to the company. We launched that in June of 2010. In December of that same year, 2010, we launched a Dragon capsule. First time a company uh, had ever launched a spaceship and brought her back, re-entered. She hangs on the ceiling right outside of Mission Control at SpaceX. It's like our corporate teddy bear. We keep it there um, to make sure folks remember what we're doing, kind of hard to not, but it's all right. So we ended 2010 with uh, 1,200 employees. 2008, we ended with 618 employees. So we're screaming uh, hiring-wise. I have a lot of lessons learned on that, by the way. Um, skip ahead two years, uh, and that's 2012. I addressed this audience exactly two years ago. We had just gotten the Dragon spaceship to the International Space Station. It was extraordinary for the company. I think the doubters, the people who didn't admire what we were doing or just hated us for whatever reason, um, was hard for them to criticize us on our technical chops after this particular time. Uh, we get criticized for other things, but we can talk about that later. Um, 2000, so that was 2012. Space Station, we got there twice. Uh, 2013, basically we started uh, our normal, regular uh, satellite delivery operations. We actually upgraded the Falcon 9 in between uh, those flights. And uh, yeah, we basically opened up a $2 billion market in December of last year by flying the SES-8 satellite uh, to its uh, geosynchronous transfer orbit. So we ended 2013 with 3,200 employees. What next? What are we going to do next? Um, I talked a little bit about it. We're going to turn the Dragon cargo capsule into a crew capsule. We just did a big unveil last week. I don't know if you guys took a look. For you space nerds, I'm sure you saw it. Um, for those of you who didn't, it's worth looking at. It is basically the 21st century rocket ship that's going to carry people to space. So it's pretty cool. Um, so that's crew. Falcon Heavy. It'll be the largest launch vehicle flying since the Saturn moon rocket. Uh, we should debut this next year. We've got, it, I don't know, understand why it's so hard. It's just three Falcon 9 launch vehicles glued together. At least that's what I'm telling my team. Um, they get mad at me. But uh, uh, we're building a new launch site. We're going to actually lift this off from uh, the historic launch complex 39A, which is where Saturn flew, it's where the shuttle flew, and we're going to fly heavy from there as well. With Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy, this covers the entire uh, space market as anyone knows it today. Um, I'm sure stuff will evolve to get bigger and we'll build another rocket that's even bigger. Actually, our transporter to Mars is a bigger rocket, but that's a little bit later. What's critically important about getting people to Mars is being able to bring them back. Uh, so what we're trying to do is develop a rocket that is reusable.
lakes are not on fire. Probably one of the most important things that SpaceX had done to date, and I want to talk a little bit why about why. Um, you guys have all taken airplanes. You reuse the airplane, right? You, the airplane goes on its mission, people go on, they get off, they fly to another place, that airplane is used again. Well, rockets are not used again. You throw the entire rocket away after every use. So let's say you're taking people to Mars, you take them, and then you've thrown the rocket away. So they're stuck. And it's possible that people that go to Mars might not like to stay on Mars. So, because it's like camping. I don't like camping. Um, I would come back, probably. I'd go there because it's cool, and then I'd come back. Uh, but it's critically important to figure out, both from the price perspective of the mission, uh, but really, you need to bring folks back after you take them somewhere. So the rocket has to land, like what you saw there, uh, and be able to be refueled and lifted off again. So that was really important. It's a really hard problem. Uh, we just did, that's a little test. We went a kilometer high. We're going to continue to increase our altitude. We're going to move that uh, test capability to New Mexico because they have a bigger area with nobody in it and no cows either um, <laughs> so that we can go higher and higher until we basically hit the flight regime that we're looking for to demonstrate that we can uh, uh, bring, these back, it's back, or bring these rockets back and reuse them. I do have a photo from uh, a flight that we executed in September of last year. Um, it's really hard to see, but on the left, you see that flame? That's actually uh, hypersonic retro propulsion. The rocket is actually burning while it's coming back. And then what you see on the right is that rocket just before it hit the water. Now, what I failed to show here is that it was going really fast, and so it broke up when it hit. Um, however, no one's ever brought a rocket back uh, from a suborbital, suborbital trajectory, so that was, really, that was a key, key demonstration. In addition, on this last flight that we had, uh, on uh, April 18th, we flew another mission to the International Space Station. Uh, we actually soft landed that stage in the water. Now it was in 28 foot seas, so after it was bouncing around for about eight minutes, it did uh, break up. Um, so at some point, and hopefully this year, you'll see us land back on land. So we'll fly this stage back. Uh, obviously, the range, the Cape Canaveral, has to get really comfortable with the incomer. So we've got some work to do, but hopefully this year we'll be bringing, uh, bringing a stage back. and then. Probably by mid next year, assuming we get that technology right, every, we will recover every first stage. Second stage is really hard, harder even than this really hard problem, but I think we'll make, uh, certainly we'll get the first stage back. So now what do we do? Uh, after we do crew, after we get Falcon Heavy flying, after we're making major progress on reusability, we have to go to Mars. Um, and I'd like to talk a little bit about why. Um, I don't know if you've heard, but uh, Mars is actually quite similar in structure and geology to, uh, to Earth. Um, in fact, uh, I think at one point people or scientists believed that there was water flowing uh, on Mars. There's uh, Grand Canyons. Uh, you see Grand Canyon on the left. I'm just comparing Earth to Mars. Um, and Victoria Crater uh, on the right. They have mountains and uh, volcanoes just like we do on Earth. Um, their fundamental rock structure is very similar as well. So, you know, maybe, uh, maybe someday it'll feel like home. So I have 11 minutes exactly for questions. Yes.
I love your story. Thank you so much. It was just exciting. Um, a comment. How did you get that money after you had that failure? That was my question. And then uh, the other question I have is, when you were a little girl, did you envision doing what you're doing now? Is this something that was always part of what you wanted to do when you grew up? So I'll answer the second one first, because it's easier. Absolutely not. I was, uh, I didn't know anything about engineering as a little kid, of course, um, but uh, if I was interested in any mechanical device, it was cars. I was very interested in cars. Uh, as a matter of fact, when I was in third grade, my mom was driving me back from the grocery store, probably. We lived way out in the middle of nowhere. Um, and I asked her, how does a car work? I mean, I kind of knew that an engine turned this way, but the car kind of turns in a different way. And so she bought me a book, and I read it, and I'm like, okay, that's how a car engine works. Um, and luckily, she pushed me. Uh, she's an artist. My father was a brain surgeon. And, uh, and she said I should be an engineer. And she pushed me, which doesn't usually work with teenage girls, by the way. Lesson learned. Don't push your girls. Um, but for whatever crazy reason, uh, I, I took her up on it, and, uh, and it, uh, yeah, it allowed me to work with uh, extraordinary people at SpaceX and do crazy stuff. Oh, so the first question, how in the world do we win that contract? So it's not that unusual for organizations to win big contracts, even though they have had lots of failures in the past. Um, it was a, a little bit unusual to get that much money at that early a stage for us. Um, but we had been firing engines, you know, a brand new, actually a brand new LOX hydrocarbon engine, uh, which hadn't been done in three decades in the United States. So we had definitely demonstrated some technical chops in that point, in that time frame. Um, but NASA went out on a limb. This whole program was really the dark horse program. They had the Aries and the Orion program as their kind of program of record, and then they gave a little bit of money. So half a million dollars, or half a billion dollars in that time frame was little. Uh, the Aries and Orion budget, monthly budget, was about spend about $360 million a month. Um, so this was little for them. And uh, what they really wanted to do was facilitate new entrants in the space industry to really try to shake things up. And they did that. It's very successful. Two brand new launch vehicles. So we received, after contract change, or excuse me, agreement changes and adding scope, NASA in the end gave us $396 million. We spent about 450 to 480 of our own. Uh, million dollars, um, and so for less than a billion dollars, the United States government got a brand new launch vehicle, which competes on the international market. Uh, U.S. used to own commercial launch. Uh, we lost it in the early 90s, and uh, SpaceX, in 2012, we won every commercially competed mission in our vehicle class. Didn't make the Russians happy, who cares? Uh, it didn't make, uh, didn't make the uh, Europeans very happy either. Mm -hmm. When did you get past SpaceX? I was the seventh employee. I started in 2002. Now we have uh, about 3,600 employees, about 500 contractors. Were you like the first batch? I was in the first batch. <laughs> we were dribbling in every couple weeks. How do you make sure you maintain quality while you are scaling up? So there's, there are a couple of challenges with the growth, both on the, the HR front, the human capital growth, as well as uh, the reliability for sure. Um, the way we develop products, uh, we work with a very close-knit group of engineers and basically our R&D technicians. Um, and we work it through probably two builds. We have production watch us during the second build. The engineering development team does it all the first time. Um, production watches it second time does it the third time with development teams watching it. Um, we still have a little bit to learn in that handover, uh, but what's really different about SpaceX, we've designed these rockets and these spaceships to be very testable, like right before launch, test them. So if you've missed things along the way, as inevitably people do, um, you, can, you catch it before you lift off. So it's, it's, it's not easy to do, and, and hopefully you know, we don't have a launch failure. Um, because we are scaling. We used to build about two systems a year, and this year we'll produce 12 rockets and four spaceships. Next year we have to build about 24 rockets and eight spaceships, so we're growing fast. We do have a full-blown uh, ISO certified, AS9100 certified quality program. There's lots of eyes on this stuff, and we test everything, 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 everything. I have a question regarding your cost control. It's just amazing that you build everything right here in California, but yet you're able to compete from a
cost perspective. Can you share a little bit more detail on lessons learned there? Sure. Um, so, it, you know, we spend a lot of money every month, like 80, almost $100 million a month. So it doesn't feel like we have a lot of control, um, but we do. <laughs> Don't want to scare anybody. Um, we designed this system from the beginning. We thought about how we were going to build it. We thought about how we were going to operate it. Um, and if you think about if you think about the whole life cycle of the of the technology, hopefully you make smart decisions um, about uh, things such as factory floor space. We build in kind of low bay space. Our hook height's about 43 feet, um, whereas lots of aerospace industries build in buildings that have an eight, you know 60, 70 foot hook height. My square footage is about 50 cents a square. Um, their square footage is about 12 bucks a square per month. So, um, so we thought about that. An another thing that we did, we architected, I don't know if you watch, um, uh, most domestic uh, launch providers basically have a mobile service tower. So they kind of build the rocket up on the launch pad with this high rise office building that rolls back. So it's a high rise office building on wheels on federal property, it's not cheap. So, um, so we thought about how we were going to build it, how we were going to operate it, and, and, and made some smart decisions uh, that kept costs low. And then we're, we're, we actually are rigorous on cost control. Our vendors, we are buying in quantities. Most people in this industry don't buy in quantities. Aircraft, yeah, but not rockets. Um, you, we have nine engines on the back end of the Falcon 9. That's where the name, the name came from. It's super clever. Um, <laughs> so we're going to be building 400, 500 engines a year. So that's, that's kind of low quantity production. So. We work really hard at it every day, cracking the whip. Who's next? I think I'm next. Oh, okay, um, sorry. Hi. Uh, so, uh, are you competing with NASA to go to Mars? Are you collaborating with them? That's the first part of my question. The second part is, aside from the wow factor, uh, is there a business case uh, a bus you know, for going to Mars? So, I think it's going to take a village, frankly, to get to Mars. Uh, we just want to make sure. We're there with the best of them. Um, I think, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm forecasting, but I'm pretty sure we'll be there hand in hand with NASA and probably some other pretty unique organizations and, uh, and countries as well. It's going to be a huge, huge deal to, to make this work. Um, so that was that question. And the other question was? Oh, the business case for Mars. Um, we're going to go anyhow. Um, <laughs> but, but I do believe there is a business case. Um, if you take enough people there, the ride home is free because we got to bring the rockets back. Um, if you take enough people there at about a half a million per per seat. I, there's a business case. It's just it's hard to see it now. It's obviously incredibly speculative. Is there more time? If two minutes and thirty-seven seconds. Uh. Okay. Uh, wonderful presentation and videos. I think it was super cool. Um, so do you guys um, encourage kids to come to your facility and take something like a field trip? My kids had been to JPL in, uh, in Pasadena, I guess, and they really enjoyed it. So is there other activities and summer is coming up, so. Yeah, we do bring school groups to SpaceX. It's not a public place. You know, you have to know somebody mm -hmm. uh, to get a tour, um, but we, we never turn down school kids. That we, okay. we do tours pretty regularly, a couple a week actually. For so what's kids. the process? Can I, do I go through you? <laughs> All right, uh, send an email to Emily okay. at SpaceX.com. Okay, thank you. Uh -huh. Hi, my question is related to Carrier. So uh, personally, like, what do you feel when you join SpaceX as a seventh employee in the company? What influenced you or what were your confi confidence to join this company and b go for your dream, like build for the team? So I had been in the aerospace industry. Uh, the question is basically kind of why did I join or what have I learned? Um, it was a huge risk to you know, leave a pretty stable job and, and go work for a guy 10 years younger than me who says he wants to build a rocket. Um, <laughs> so it was a big risk, but uh, I had been in the business for, gosh, it was 2002, for 14 years at the time. And um, I was really frustrated with the state of innovation in the industry. Um, and I thought, you know, this is the last job I will ever do in this industry, because if it doesn't work, I'd rather go sell real estate or be a barista. Um, <laughs> it, you know, it's a pretty, it was, it's a pretty, or has been a pretty stagnant industry. Um, and so it was worth the leap, for sure. 
Um, and I was hired in as chief of sales. Um, I had demonstrated my ability to do that in previous jobs, so I wasn't nervous about that part. Um, as a matter of fact, that's really my, I am an engineer, but uh, my contribution primarily to the company was building the manifest, uh, bringing the money in. So did I, did I answer your question? Is that good enough? Okay. There's a question in the very back. 22 seconds. Notice how she immediately looked at the clock. Of all the people that would come up here, she's the one that definitely would look at a clock. <laughs> Hi, I have a question. It's not rocket science, but um, I was just wondering, are you looking at alternative energy fuels, for instance, like um, you know the algae fuels or any, any other sources of energy to launch rockets, and can you disclose any of them? Uh, I won't so? disclose the details, but we are right. funding some algae-based fuel testing on our engines. I think we're actually paying a little bit on the development side as well. Yeah, it would be great if, because uh, the, the current planned fuel for Mars is, is liquid oxygen uh, locks a methane system. You can create uh, methane on the surface of Mars. So anyhow, I'm out, <laughs> zero, thank you very much.